Kim Allen. speakers in, you know, we have the t-shirts made, there's a lot of expenses that you don't see on the surface. So we will have a donation jar by the door, and if you enjoyed today, if you enjoyed Mr. Randy's talk, say thank you in the great American way. Because <laughs> we do have to pay bills and things. Uh, but I also want to commend Dr. Hudson, who has told us that he is going to donate the cost of his airfare. Yeah. And, um, and again, that will help and take a great deal, but uh, a few dollars from some of you that can throw it in the jar should be would be greatly appreciated. Anything else? I really, uh, you came here to hear Randy, not me, I'm sorry, but <laughs> what a great you, day. Thank you. Give it up again for Jeanette. <laughs> This is the campus I teach on, so they're afraid of me. Um, <laughs> we're going to book this this coming week for next year. Again, uh, plan on a Saturday. Satan's birthday will be on a it's leap year, isn't it? So that means it'll be on a Friday. So plan on, I'm looking at November 10th. Next year, same place, same time. Look for the announcements. And next year we'll fill this auditorium. We will. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and another thank you for Jeff. Jeff has taken care of our website, carlsaganday.com. And even though he lives in Chicago, he's part of this group as much as anybody that um, is here local. So we owe him a great debt, and you're doing just a bang up job. As, as a thank you for that. Um, so, uh, who was it that uh, Reggie opened his talk by saying that uh, there are people that you don't have to introduce, and those who do aren't worthy of being introduced? This is certainly one of those moments. So I will just say that sitting next to me is James the Amazing Randy. So, we are here to talk about your friend, Carl Sagan, and he was your friend. He was not someone you knew and admired. He was your friend. Yes, he was. And you know, I've tried to think I've been very thing for a long time now. When is the first time that I met Carl? It's so strange to not remember that moment because it was obviously a great moment in my life. But it seems to me that I was so familiar with his work at the time that I met him. It was, uh, it was just part of a natural process, part of a procedure. And I remember that I had uh, I had lunch with him and his, his first wife, Lynn. And um, that was in a little French restaurant someplace in the wilds of New York City. And uh, we had our first really good knockdown and drag out of the conversation. And we hit it off very well, I thought. And I was rather excited to, to be in his presence at the moment. And I never lost that. Every time that I... I saw Carl loom up again, whether at his home at Cornell or in one of his classrooms or wherever. It was always uh, 
I experience it. It's something that I, I don't feel very often. I feel it with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. That's it, it, yeah, that's astonishing. I get the same kind of feeling. I get a little buzz when I know that I'm in the presence of people like that. Uh, I have been so fortunate in that respect. You know, thinking back over it all, over all the years with uh, well, people like Carl Woodburn and uh, Sir John Maddox and uh, oh goodness, I, 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 I better not start naming them, but knowing important, really important people like that. Uh, it's been such a privilege to me. Uh, I, I can't quite get over it, and I don't know how it quite happened. I attracted them, or they attracted me, or something, I don't know. But in any case, we did uh, uh, touch hands and uh, did a lot of hugging over the years. And knowing these people and knowing that they're my personal friends, that, that's exhilarating, very exhilarating. What first interested you in astronomy? And I'm sure that was before you met Carl. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I was four. No, I, uh, I was uh, born and more or less brought up in Toronto, Canada, or Toronto, as we call it. And uh, we had very good clear skies. I lived in the northern end of the city, and we had uh, wonderful skies with northern lights. Oh, my goodness. Some of the displays when the season was modest. The northern lights that I saw there, breathtaking, big, shimmering uh, veils of yellow and, and green, mostly green and blue, but sometimes pink and magenta, are just wonderful things. And then behind them, all the stars. And uh, I was very familiar with the Royal Ontario Museum, <coughs> which is a very, very famous place and a marvelous place of learning. And uh, they had. Uh, uh, an observatory there and uh, a planetarium. And uh, they, I met the head astronomer there, and he gave me a bunch of maps. I have some of them still. Made on blueprint paper, of all things. Can you imagine? Made on blueprint paper of certain constellations where meteor showers would originate. And I would get the appropriate one out when the meteor shower was due, and I'd get out on the deck chair in the backyard there. Presumably, the weather was sort of old first, and Canada knows how to do weather, yeah. you know. And uh, I would sit out there in the dark and, uh, with, a, with a white pencil. I used my mother's uh, white pencil in her makeup jar. She used to put under her nails and whiten her nails. She never knew that. She wondered why I was dull all the time, but she never quite knew it. And uh, I made marks on the, the maps, and then I would send them in to the uh, Royal Ontario Museum, uh, and they would always express astonishment over the way I drew them. Now, I must explain to you, you perhaps wouldn't know, but meteor showers appear to come from a particular spot in the sky because they are large masses of little bits of, of matter from so big to be sat down to the size of a grain of dust, and some bigger too, of course, that are on an orbit around the Earth and the, around the sun, pardon me, around the earth, around the sun, and the earth's orbit intersects them every now and then, and of course at night, you can't see them during the day, but they're not bright enough, uh, they intersect the atmosphere, and it appears to be coming, each one of the shots of light, the shooting stars, so to speak, appears to be coming from a certain spot in the sky, and that spot in the sky is connected with a star, of course, some constellation or other, and it gets to be known by the name of that particular constellation. And actually, what they are is parallel uh, strokes of light that are coming, in little bits of matter that are coming into the atmosphere, but they appear to be emanating from the source. That's called the radiant point. And so I would mark all my radiant points up there. And the uh, Royal Astronomical Society sent me a letter one time, which I've lost years ago. Damn. I tell you, I, some things like that that I'll never see again, but what that was very, very proud of that. It was rather chattered by the time I put it away in Strathmore. But they sent me a letter saying that my plots were very interesting because I included everything that I saw. Because there are other meteors coming into the atmosphere too, of course. I would spot them over there and I would mark that on the back. It didn't belong to the same shower, not at all, not the same uh, uh, orbit or anything of that nature. But uh, they were amazed that I actually marked other shooting stars up. Well, most of the students didn't do that. So, so 
You get the sense that Randy and Carl Sagan may have had something to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so Carl famously said of you, and I'm reading it, and I want the quote to be exactly correct. We may not always agree with Randy, but we ignore him at our peril. This was Carl Sagan referring to James Randy right here. Well, what did you disagree about? Well, <clears throat> um, I discussed during that, that, that lunch that I had with Lynn. Um, I discussed the Irving Governor from off and on, of course. Uh, and uh, I gave him a couple of demonstrations of it, and, and he was pleased to see that. But we disagreed on a few points on uh, how Geller could attract such a crowd. I knew the media somewhat better. Carl did at that time, I believe, and uh, I, I think I still think I was right. So that, <laughs> but uh, those are small points that we disagreed on, and I didn't have the scientific attitude or the scientific uh, uh, exactitude that he had. I didn't perhaps say perhaps or likely or probably as often as he would, and uh, so we had small disagreements on that, but largely we got along very well. Well, it, it, it's no small thing to be endorsed by Carl Sagan, I can say. Uh, so, getting into a little bit more of a religious topic. Um, there are claims that Carl had a deathbed conversion. Oh, I've seen this on the internet, and people have said this to me. Like, well, you can say what you want about Carl Sagan, but you know, on his deathbed, he converted to Christianity, or oh, they'll say it in the, their own language. He gave himself to Christ. Uh, what, what do you, and, and his wife, Anne, by the way, disputes this, and uh, I, I tend to think she would be the one to listen to. Yeah. Well, what are your thoughts on that? I called Anne as soon as I heard that, and uh, she called me on the phone. She said, I was with Carl when he died. I held his hand. He simply closed his eyes and said, Bye. Nothing more. And that's all I knew. That's what Anne said, and that's what Carl did. And I believe it, and, but I knew, I knew the moment I heard of his demise, I knew that that rumor would start to go around, because the woo-woos out there could not possibly have Carl, but until she had my dad dying without acknowledging the presence of a deity, they couldn't have it. And what an insult to this man. What a total insult. Absolutely. It's, it's like they're, they're saying now about a well known writer, which you know, is, is uh, probably terminally ill with cancer. And they're, they're going to say, the minute that he closed his eyes to it, oh, yes, but I heard that he did a conversion. And I've already announced on Swift, while in the past, that he would not do that, and I knew he would not do that. This is a cowardly, terrible insult to a, to a person of that integrity. Uh, and believe me, if they ever say it about me, <laughs> give him a fist in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for me. <laughs> and you know the nice thing about claims like that is you can use Carl's own baloney detection kit to tear it right apart, because after all, how the hell would they know? And were they in the room with them? So, oh, and Anna also, also told me here that conversation. She said, and we looked at one another, and we both knew. This is very, very telling. We both knew that we were not going to see one another again, and it didn't matter. That's the way to go. Absolutely. Carl, Carl managed to be spiritual while being firmly grounded in the real world, which is no small feat. And I, I think that's what truly made him special. I've said that several times this weekend, but that's what I think. He's read so, read so many things that he has written. I mean, the, the one thing that this man could be famous for, in my estimation, is just the expression, the pale blue dot. That's poetry. That moves me enormously. And when you see it in that picture of Saturn's rings, that pale blue dot in there, damn, we did that. We made a machine. We threw it up into the air on rockets and uh, 
went around and it's still going around someplace, I'm sure it's taking pictures, and it took that picture of us back there. And then you read what Carl said about that pale blue dot. You've all heard this just recently, I know. And that, that's poetry. There's no greater poetry than what Carl wrote on that. He was a great poet, a great thinker, a great man. Well, speaking of that, you know, we're here we are honoring this man. Um, and in the 2009 edition of Randy Speaks, which you can still see at randy.org, this is a, a weekly show that Randy did. Uh, and on Carl's birthday in 2009, Randy lauded the man for being a teacher, which is where Carl is at his best. And yet at the same time, while Carl is opening up this whole new world to people through his books and, and shows, He's being criticized by the science community. In fact, he was denied a position in the American Academy of Science because of his popularization of science. What do you think of that? It's a dreadful insult to the man. Dreadful to end to us. Dreadful insult to Carl's memory and to us. That Now, he, he told me several times that he had his colleagues saying to him, but Carl, you're an astronomer. Get back to astronomy. But Carl knew. He obviously knew that what he was doing outside of astronomy, though with that as his coloration and his background, his backdrop, if you will, as you see in most of his photographs, of course, uh, he knew that his teaching and his imparting to the world of what we have gained from him over the years was much more important than the general picture of an astronomer. There are lots of astronomers, but there were very few astronomers like Carl Sagan, he understood that, and, and that was an insult to him to him not to have been accepted that way. That's, that, that's another insult. I, yeah. so we've got to do something about that. Too. We've got to remedy that, and that's why we're here. I'm sure we'll all agree on that. We've got to make that name better known, more known, and in greater depth, and we've got to go out and preach the word, okay? <laughs> and one way to do that is Buy these books, and if you're like me, you'll notice they don't stay on the shelf very long. Because sure. you'll get into a conversation at a coffee shop, and you'll say, Oh, well, I have to let you borrow this book, and it will disappear. And it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I, I know you famously had conversations with Richard Feynman about uh, Connor. You know, he would call you up and say, How was this trick done? He would you know, tell you. Well, a little deeper than that, don't you? Let me just tell you a little bit. With Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate for the Feynman diagrams, and I won't get into all that. It's uh, something quite beyond my ken, but it's a physics idea in physics, a, a very penetrating idea in physics. But Richard Feynman was a young, not only played the Volvo drums, but he was a physicist, you see. He thought that Volvo drums were more important in some respects, but uh, he won a Nobel Prize for that. Now, uh, we had a game. Richard and I, we had a bit of a game. Oh, what fun I had with that. I would uh, take him unawares by doing some miracle of a semi-religious nature, as I often refer to it. I'd do some trick on him, but he wasn't ready for it. And he would draw back at it and then say, uh oh, was that one of them? And I'd say, yes, that's one of them. Now, by that, I meant we had an agreement that he could ask any question about how it was done, as long as it was a yes or no, or question doesn't apply, ask those three possibilities. So he could ask any question he wanted to about it, then or any other time. He never failed to solve the trick. Now that's, that's saying something, because I do some pretty damn good stuff every now and then. And uh, I, 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 I did, can I tell you? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, Dick Feynman was, uh, he taught at, was it UCLA or? No, Caltech. Caltech. Caltech, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Caltech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill King, you should know. Caltech, yes. And um, I called him, called him one day and I said, uh, uh, at his office, and I said, uh, uh, Dick, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in town, and uh, I'm uh, out at the airport. Um, I don't know whether you have time or not, but I can't find a cab up here. This is a lie. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Dorothy lie, no question of it. And he said, yeah, sure. He loved to drive out to the airport. He drove a big old a, a convertible of some kind, of a big old Buick. It was 400 yards long, at least. 
uh, <laughs> huge, huge amounts of coming on trip. And uh, so I stood there with my luggage outside the airport, and uh, he pulled up through the luggage. I met him through the luggage in the back. I'll tell you why in a moment. And uh, he put the luggage in the back, hopped in, and we headed off. And he started to tell me stories, and I told him stories in the whole business. And so we. Uh, <clears throat> Justin, okay, and um, uh, we we got in uh, in time for his class. And I went and sat in the back of the classroom and just drank in everything. I didn't understand what they were doing on the board. They were designing computer chips and, and on transparencies, laying one over the other. And I had no idea what they were doing, but I was just in heaven listening to him talk, talking with the, the students, and exchanging little uh, bits of knowledge with them. And uh, the end of the period came. The only way he knew the end of the period came was when the students who were coming in to call him and knock on the door <laughs> because he didn't pay any attention to the bells. Right? Neither did his students. He had a hard time getting into one of the room. <coughs> so I suggested to him that we would go to lunch. It was time for lunch. It was a very early flight, obviously, in the morning. And um, we went to, to lunch at his favorite Mexican restaurant. Walked in, and uh, the Dr. D. met us and sat in. Table way over by the window, a little table for two, and we uh, ordered coffee to start with. And uh, while I was talking with him, I reached across the table and took his spoon from his coffee cup. But I said, Oh, watch this. I didn't think, didn't want to make the color variations on it. And it twisted up and did strange things and then fell into pieces. And he looked at it and said, Wow. Oh, was that one of them? I said, that was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we started in our questions. So we, well, anyway, I, I, I'm going to get into that a bit later. But what had happened was when I called him, I was at the airport, it's true. But I had already been there for two days in Los Angeles. <laughs> I went around to uh, the college and uh, his favorite Mexican restaurant. He always had lunch there. I knew that he would choose that restaurant. And then Bill on the way. He didn't know any other restaurant, I'm sure. That <laughs> was his favorite restaurant. And I went in to see him after he had received. Now I met Julie really Joe uh, on, uh, on your, your favorite customer. Wonderful. Yeah. And we really got in on it. We were conspirators right away. And uh, so I said, all you do is I gave him a well prepared spoon. And uh, he took it and put it away in the cupboard and he said, and what are you coming in? I said, yeah, I'll be ready. And I'll over, I'll put you on the table over there and find it. So I had it all set up. That's how he got the spoon on his, his conference here. And uh, I reached back, oh, took it off as if it was a perfectly strange spoon that made there by the restaurant. So it was all set up in advance like that. So now he could ask me any questions he wanted. Now, he didn't ask me anything at the moment. He said, well, he didn't say, was that spoon especially prepared? And I said, yes, aha, uh -huh. okay. And, that only, and he would always say it this way, that only leads these questions to be asked, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you them later. Okay. In other words, that made him, it separated the problem, all these were out and out, these were the possibilities here. That's the way he thought. And I think that's the way most good scientists think. Anyway, the point was that I, I left Los Angeles and that thing he still hadn't solved it or offered any solutions. I went back to New Jersey where I lived at the time. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, my bedside phone rang. And I woke up and said, hello. He said, hi, hey, fine. Listen, if you had said that there was, I said, Dick, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said, no, it isn't. It, oh, oh, you're, you're in New Jersey. I said, yes, now, Dick. You see, the Earth rotates on its axis. <laughs> as soon as the North Pole it rotates in a counterclockwise direction, that means there are and there are things called time zones. And if you know that, I know. Now, apparently, you don't know that. <laughs> he said, "Well, if the winter had said so and so," and I said, "Yes, yes." The answer is yes. Okay. He said, "Okay, I'll get back and click." Hello. I want to make sure he was holding me back that day, maybe. You see, and so I, I made it wait for the rest of the night, waiting for the phone to ring again. You see. But he wasn't apparently aware of the geology and geography and things like that. He didn't know about those things. 
So I, that, that was the fun that I had with Dick Feynman. He was a great sport, and hey, bongo drums, I mentioned that, didn't I? Yes. Uh, yeah, very, very well. Uh, a, a great man and a very good friend. And, uh, oh, they, I, I, I'm, I'm leaving Carl. I'm sorry, Carl. I mean, sorry. Yeah, well, I don't think anyone regrets the departure there. Uh, <laughs> but what about Carl? You know, one, all the things I've seen, he, he never really discusses magic that I'm aware of. But uh, did you ever have discussions with him about conjuring? And Oh yes, yeah, some some basics of it. As a matter of fact, with Lynn that very first time uh, in, in the restaurant, I, uh, for some strange reason, did a couple of spoon tricks. <laughs> That's how we got into the government discussion. See. And uh, I managed to uh, astonish Lynn. At least I don't know that I astonished Carl. He didn't show much sign of that. But well, I uh, I got to spend some time with him at Cornell. We did a whole thing on developing a course with critical thinking. I don't know what happened to that, you know. I have no idea. I, I know that he made lots of notes, and he even called me for some suggestions on how he could express such and such a thing. Well, I, I don't know what happened to it either, but I co-taught a course in critical thinking in Vermont in a school, and uh, even though the students loved it, it was well attended, they got rid of the program, and now at that particular college, there is no course in critical thinking. Uh, I wish I knew what happened to that, but he kept a lot of notes on so I'm with stacks of them. So, moving right along. Well, moving right along. So, with retirement at the space shuttle, NASA appears to be phasing out games to space exploration, at least for a little while. Now, do you, what do you think Carl would think of that? I mean, he, he famously was against the space shuttle program because he thought it wasn't the best use of resources at this time. But I've heard you say something a little different about that. Well, yeah, only from an emotional point of view. And, yeah. I, uh, I agree with Bob Clark as well, the yes. well physicist, uh, who says that we have squandered a lot of money on uh, actually putting astronauts up in space when so much could have been done with automated machinery. And, and I have to agree. And certainly they had to do it on Mars. They, they weren't ready to cover those distances and, uh, with the facilities that they presently have. Um, but I also think that a great deal was accomplished uh, by the fact that they did have astronauts, actual people, men and women, who travel out into space, and dressed in space suits, and landed on the moon. <laughs> I, I have a hard time saying that. We landed on the bloody moon. I mean, that's getting real. That, that's, for me to have said that as a child, that we would someday, in my lifetime, have people landing on the moon and getting back on this silly thing and squirting up into space and getting back. Wow, that's astonishing. I'm still astonished at it. But I think that astonishment that, that I have, still have, I, I confess that truly, has been taken up by so much of our younger generation that astronauts, I certainly hope, are heroes to these people. And they're all heroes to me, even Ed Mitchell. Don't that. Yeah. Uh, they're all heroes to me because uh, they are our, our modern day heroes. Uh, nothing took more courage than to get on the end of those things and get squared up into space uh, with all that technology right behind your rear end pushing you up <laughs> into the void. Wow, that takes a lot of courage. I, I, it's something I would not have done. I could not watch it. I hung over to Niagara Falls in a straitjacket and a few other things. and. Uh, and did some daring stuff. It wasn't all that daring. Uh, not certainly not as daring as being squirted up into space on the end of a rock. No way, I would not have done that. But I, that's why I think there was great value uh, to the, the whole existence of NASA and what they did. That it inspired young people. And I've talked to a number of, of uh, people in their 20s and 30s who were inspired by that and, and got them into science. I, I think it was worthwhile from that point of view, maybe not dollar for dollar. It was the best investment of, of our dollars, but nonetheless, I think it worked. It's a very good point. I mean, we have a number of probes up there right now doing stuff, and we don't hear about them very much. You know, once in a while you hear that one of the Mars rovers is still going. Or Voyager is still up there doing science. Carl Sagan yeah. helped create this, this probe. It's still up there, still doing science. And, uh, you know, we don't hear about it, and um, yet when the space shuttle was retired recently, I saw in the virtual world that I live in people crying about on it about Twitter and young people, you know, not people my age 
who had lived through them all. Um, I was three. But uh, you know, people grew up with the space shuttle. That meant something to them. We, we were a country that could go to space, and we're not really that anymore. And given how this country doesn't seem to be interested in science anymore, I'm actually much more worried about this coming generation that uh, yeah. they don't even have a space shuttle. And the only thing I can think of that we can do to stem this tide is to stop clicking on the Kardashian links and <laughs> take the time to go to page four. Yeah, not only do they not have a shuttle, they don't have an astronaut. And a living human being that can do this thing and will do this thing. That's exciting. Wow, those are the Lone Rangers. Right. You know, that yeah. and they exist, they're real people. Yeah, young man came up to me today and said that he wanted to work for NASA. And I, I thought that was great. He didn't say he wanted to be an astronaut. That was an interesting moment for me. You know, every kid wants to be an astronaut, but there aren't any of them. I mean, there still are, of course, but it's... Yeah. So, so um, well, you know, time is an issue, but, uh, you know, if there's one story you have to tell. You know the story. The story about the astronomy joke you saw on the internet. And you thought of the car. <laughs> yeah. I think I told that last year. But I'll tell you again, there's got to be people here that are bastards. They're reviews and short memories, I hope. Uh, yes, I uh, was seated at the, the foundation in my office. Uh, uh, Andrew Carter was sitting on the couch across the room from me. And I was looking at my, my monitor, my computer monitor, and I started to laugh. And uh, Andrew looked up and said, what's so funny? I said to him, uh, oh, astronomical joke or something just sent me on the screen here. And I read it to him, and he laughed. And I reached out my hand like this. And Andrew looked at me and said, what's the matter? And I literally did this. I turned my hand and looked into my hand. <laughs> Talk to my hand. <laughs> <laughs> like this. I turned to Andrew and I said, I was going to call Carl. Carl had been dead for years. And I was instinctively, after reading the astronomical joke, about to call Carl. All I had to do was pick up the phone and go click, click, and he was number two on the dollar, and it would break through to Cornell. And I was going to call Carl. And I was so spooked out of that, and Andrew went, ooh, you know. <laughs> and I immediately took the number off my dial. I put Andrew in his number in place of it. It was the same number for his home. Anyway, but uh, I, I assigned that to Andrew. And uh, that, that was spooky. I, because when you take people off your automatic dialer, you admit they're dead, you know, or you don't want to talk to them. I mean, but uh, <laughs> the point is, I didn't want to quite admit that. And that, was, that was hard to do, hard to do. Yeah, I miss him. I think we all do, and I, I think we need him more than ever. And I really hope events like this will help keep him alive. And, uh, and when that Cosmo show comes on, you better all be watching it with the man That's how we're going to do it. <laughs> so we have time for a few questions here. Um, and thank you, Randy, for, for offering that, uh, that interview. It was really much appreciated, and uh, I know people got a lot out of it. Oh, my pleasure. So I'm going to come down and uh, run around and. Anything is open. Oh, and Jeanette has the first question here. Oh, I'm in trouble. What, what makes you think we're out of time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, because, you know, let's, people came here to hear Randy, so let's, I mean, I, I think the questions are a great idea, but there's no hurry. So, as long as he's willing to stay, we're willing to stay and listen to him. Okay, I'll speak You're very sure. <laughs> Okay, so we, we are going to go with questions now because uh, that was the end of my interview part. So <laughs> I can hold on. Did you get any? Uh, uh, did Carl talk to you about who who was uh, his favorite astronomer or who influenced him as an astronomer? I don't think that I don't think that I ever heard that. No, um, no, I don't remember ever having discussed that uh, with Carl. Uh, his favorite astronomer. What about yours? What? What about yours? Who, 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 who do you like? Who, who 
Of all time. Say good. Besides, yeah, no, uh, I, I told Carl the whole story of me going to the David Dunlap Observatory, north of Toronto, for the very first time. I, I know he took me up. My father, he wasn't interested in that sort of thing. And uh, they put me up. I mean, they, they didn't take uh, interruptions of their observing schedule very easily, but they actually did take the main instrument. And they saw this little guy who walked in, and he held me up to the eyepiece. And I looked in there. You know, I can remember it. I can remember the moment and how I felt. I was transfixed. I saw Saturn. There's no more exciting thing to see through an eyepiece than the planet Saturn. Saturn shimmering. It was the size of an orange in front of me and shimmering, very unsteady. And it was yellow and orange. And I, it, it, the astronomers had actually swung the whole damn telescope around and zeroed in on Saturn, which happened to be up in the sky at the moment, right? or truly, what can I say? But I was captured at that moment. Oh, I had to be captured. I had to know more about this. I had to know more about it. From that moment on, I've been looking for information. I've got a quest star at home, so there. Anybody got a quest star? No, nobody got a wall. Well, you have to live to get a quest star. <laughs> So anyway, yes, that, uh, I told Carl about that, and he was all smiles because he realized just how exciting it could be for a fellow that age. Randy, didn't you do something astronomical in a rather famous South American location, maybe in Peru? Uh, well, with, with the Equatorial telescope. Well, I seem to remember you—you uh, you were uh, you would sleep in in Machu Picchu. Oh, and, yes, uh, and. I seem to remember you telling me a story about looking at the stars there, but uh, but maybe not. I don't. Yeah. Know. Well, yeah, I did. No, I, folks, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to tell you, but now you can't have access to Machu Picchu like you could when I was that age in my twenties. I went to Machu Picchu, I hiked up there in Cusco, as a matter of fact. That's an arduous job, let me tell you. And uh, we actually walked up the mountain right opposite Wanda Pichu, and got to the top of Machu Picchu and walked into the city. There were, there were no guards, nothing there at that time. Now it's all turnstiles and tourists and iced tea and the whole thing and chocolate bar. Sure. Uh, but uh, no, we just walked into the city and walked around and, and touched the stones and were totally mesmerized by it. I mean, that, that was wonderful. And I slept in the rooms out in the open in the sleeping bag. Jaime Carvajal, our Ecuadorian guy, and uh, uh, Jordan, uh, Alan Jordan, who was with us. And I guess there were only the three of that on that particular expedition. Expedition, I'll be all right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we lay that night and we uh, looked out at the, the stars, and I, uh, I had my quest star with me, and then the same old quest star. And uh, yeah, we, we saw things. The skies are so clear. You could, you could read by starlight. You could read a newspaper from starlight. Which reminds me, I gotta tell the joke. I gotta tell the joke. It has nothing to do with this at all, but it's a great joke. Uh, Sherlock Holmes says to uh, Watson one day, he says, Watson, I'd like to take a trek out into the mountains. We'll do some hiking. Oh, very good. So they hopped in the carriage and they rode out to the outskirts of the city and they, and they, uh, they hiked way out of the And they had sleeping bag equipment and tent and whatnot. And they set it up. They made tea, of course. We have to do that for English. And uh, or you have to give up citizenship. <laughs> and uh, so they they constructed uh, the tent. And Holmes turned to Watson and said, Good night, Watson. We'll see you in the morning. Good night, Holmes. And off they went. And uh, in the middle of the night, <clears throat> Holmes and I just walked to Watson. Watson and said, what, What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What do you observe? He says, looks up and he says, well, I see that set of something across there. And uh, I see the next one, I see the second star from the end is, although he generally a very good seed, right? He says, and what else do you see? He said, well, I look over here. Now, that's, that appears to be a planet there. I would say that for the quarter, but it's either Saturn or Jupiter. I, I would opt for Saturn. Well, why do you have to? Uh, 
because someone has stolen the damn tent. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions. <laughs> Always in the back. The people who ask questions like to hang up in the back. And the front people are always too shy. <laughs> now, I understand you mentioned that uh, your new uh, work, Neil deGrasse Tyson, is a very influential astronomer now. But he was also influenced by Carl Sagan. Oh, yes. So there's a, like a tie in right there. That's yeah. Very important that Carl Sagan really has influenced today's. And I think he's going to get a very, very strong reaction as, uh, as co-pair of that program. I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it with great enthusiasm. Next please. Come on, don't be shy. Ah, yes. there we go. Never seen you before in my life. No. <laughs> Randy, you talking about Carl Sagan is a great juxtaposition. He's a, a great scientist and a great conjurer. And one of the things that I remember from Tam, I will never forget, is one of the greatest minds of our time, Richard Dawkins, standing in the lobby, and you and Jamie Ian Swiss telling him why he couldn't understand any of the tricks at the Penn and Teller show the night before. <laughs> Would you comment on why it is so easy for people to fool great scientists and great minds by using magic? I can certainly do that in very few words. Thank you. Uh, because scientists think logically. They think of a direct line. And magicians work in such a way as to defeat the logical mind. They work in circles. To get from A to B, the magician does it this way. Instead of a straight line, the scientist goes in a straight line and misses all the rest of the stuff. Now, scientists are very easy to fool, and as you see in parapsychological labs, very, very easy to fool, particularly by doing children, who can't possibly be that, be that smart and are. Uh, the reason, I, I would say that I would always want an audience of PhDs compared to eight year old children. And for a very strange reason, because the eight year old children, eight, nine, 10, 11, older even, are not smart enough to be sophisticated, not smart enough to be fooled. They don't know that if you take an object like, you know, what have I got? Ah, a silly old ball of Phoenix. You take an object like this and vanish it in that, in that matter. They're not smart enough, not sophisticated enough to understand that it doesn't happen that way, you see? It's just a simple a, a bit of gesturing like this and doing this guy and misdirecting your attention over here while it's held down here. You see, now you know you all have to die. And, uh, <laughs> but the point is, the child expects, if the child sees that, the child knows the Kleenex went there. But if the child only sees this, the child doesn't, is not sophisticated enough to make the assumption that I put it there because I'm looking there. They, they don't know enough about how the real world works and how people work. They, they haven't learned that much, not yet. And they're working on it. But that's another story. <laughs> so, well, children aren't, aren't sophisticated enough to be fooled. He that is a strange thing. Every time. I, I've seen him do that 150 times every time he fools people. <laughs> what? I, who else? Yes. <laughs> How did you get started doing magic, and when did you start? Desperation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll do it every time. Yes. I was a very shy kid. I only went to uh, grade school for a few years before it became evident that uh, I was falling asleep in class and such because I had already read the lessons. I didn't read the whole textbook. And uh, was bored by the whole thing. And I was actually given a, a, a pass whereby I could be at in grade school uh, and show it out. I would show them the pass. And they had never seen one before, but I would show it to them and they would make a phone call and make sure it was okay and let me go if I was in the museum or something like that. Um, so uh, it's. Well, this is, 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 is hard to explain to you. Uh, 
what was your, your question? In, in the, the same words that you asked. How did you get started doing that? How did you get started doing that? Or how did you, I, I didn't know whether it was, how did you get your attraction to magic? Well, I got started in magic, as I said, in, in desperation. Because I had to have something when I did go to school in grade school. They were practically strangers to me, and I had to have some way of approaching them. They didn't know who I was. I wasn't in school. And uh, when I would sit at the back of the classroom or whatever, and I had to do that every now and then, not only to keep the, the truancy more uh, a little happier, but I had to do it in order to keep up my connection with my peer group, you see. And what I finally went to, to high school, because I really had to establish a peer group. I was mixing with people many years older than I. So the magic was good because it enabled me to do some little sort of things to, uh, to involve them and to involve myself with them. And they began to know me, first of all, for doing the tricks. So it was a way to acquaint myself with them and to connect with them. And, and that worked very well. And I found out that, and also, uh, there was a, you know, the usual amount of bullying going on to school. And the strange kid in school who only went every now and then uh, to the school could get bullied very easily. And I had to have a way of uh, being able to work around that and get a popular group around me that would sort of stick with me and defend me if necessary. So it was a defense mechanism and it was a desperate mechanism. Uh, and that's how I really picked up the interest in it. Uh, and there were a couple of other reasons why I got interested in magic, like seeing a magician for the first time in my life and knowing I have to figure that out. I kind of thing, and I did eventually, because I got to know the magician. But it was a defense mechanism, and it worked pretty well for me. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who has the next question? Such a shy person. There's one right over there. The next one will be right here. Out <laughs> <laughs> of all of your memories of Carl, Carl Sagan, which one is your fondest? Oh, <laughs> I, I think when he laughed at my at one of my jokes at Cornell, I was that uh, uh, he, he gave me a special award at, at Cornell, and I got him exactly what he awarded was or something or other. And uh, so uh, they introduced me. Uh, he introduced me and went and sat down in the front row. I walked over to the podium. And I said, uh, oh, now I must tell you, I'll give you a little bit of background. At that time, the series was showing on PBS. Uh, that was, um, I lost it. Uh, Jacob Bronowski, as you said. Bronowski, thank you. Thank you very much. I could, uh, Jacob I had, but I didn't have Bronowski. That was the Ascent of Man, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Wonderful series. Uh, I don't, I'm sure it's on tape or DVD, I'm sure. Uh, tape. I have mean, no old thought why I would think of tape. Uh, but I'm sure it is available. If you can see the Bronowski series, The Ascent of Man, I highly recommend it, believe me. Uh, it's not cosmos, but it is just sterling, a great thing. And uh, I walked out there and I went up to the podium and uh, had a sheet of notes and I laid them down. I said, uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Sagan. <clears throat> I, I must admit to this audience that. When I came out here to deliver this little talk to you, I was undecided as to exactly what I'm from. I, I <laughs> like me. Now, this is Bernowski. I was imitating Bernowski, and I got a laugh on it right away because that's the way Bernowski spoke. Like he said in one of the introduction, the whole program it was him. At a Gothic cathedral, a close-up, leaning on the on the railing like this, and saying well, that man and did this, that, and the other thing, and finally they arrived at a wonderful period of history. It was called the Renaissance, <laughs> and the camera zoomed back and you saw he was on a Gothic cathedral. You didn't see him; you, know? you just saw a stone balustrade in front of him, and. That was a wonderful scene. Oh, I was totally taken by that. I can't wait to see it on my video again. But I was doing Bernowski. But I started my talk like that, you see, and I said, doing Bernowski, or, when I reached underneath, I came up with the corduroy jacket. 
<laughs> or another one of my heroes. And Carl literally fell on the floor. <laughs> he was sort of papers in the bag. He, he went down on one knee on the floor in, in convulsions. He really thought that was really funny. And getting a laugh like that out of Carl saying, not easy, not easy, not at all. But I got it. <laughs> and I would like to thank Jacques and Jacques. <laughs> I've rather seen that see the ascent of man. I highly recommend it, please. Yeah, in fact, uh, Cosmos was influenced by that series. It's where the idea came from. It's like, hey, what if we did that same series, but about the universe? So it's a very important series. No, okay. yeah. Next question. What about the Okay, why are you in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> What other series besides Cosmos and the one you just mentioned do you recommend? What other series uh, except those two? Uh, I don't have any your recommendations in mind. Those are the two that stick in my mind. Um, bullshit. <laughs> I don't want to bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Jamie and Adam are going to be pretty upset with you. Yeah, the Mythbusters guys might not be too pleased. <laughs> well, the, the Mythbusters just. Mythbusters, yeah. Uh, Mythbusters, uh, I'll be alright. Um, yeah, what they do, most of it, I think, uh, I, I say a good 60% of it uh, does apply to the same kind of thinking. Uh, we're going to test this to find out whether it's, it's true or not. Uh, they, they miss on a lot of things, if it's true. But um, they're good friends of mine. I, I, like that, they participated in amazing meetings in Las Vegas, as a matter of fact, and uh, did so continuously. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very fond of them and the work that they do. Yes, I, I think I should mention them. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you meet up with Jamie and have a hard time. You know, Adam Savage uh, has pulled me aside to talk about Randy. And he said, you know, Randy's his personal hero. And the idea that Adam could even attend an amazing meeting, never mind speak at one, Blows his mind. <laughs> and Adam, Adam called me on the last amazing meeting. I, I never told you this. He was in tears on the telephone. He said, "We can't come to the amazing meeting." He said, I, "I didn't realize I was signed. My agent signed me. I've got to be someplace else." And he told me where he was going. And he was in tears. And all apologetic, he kept calling me all the way through town and, and apologizing. What are you doing now? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, we got Richard Dawkins. He, he came in to fill in for you guys. <laughs> you mentioned the series, which are really good works of science, inquiry, or skepticism. But running swift in the JREF, I'm sure you get the other end of the spectrum. What do you think, not, not just you know, an interview with say, Sylvia Brown and Harry Yellen, what do you think is some of the worst of the series, of the unskeptical, incredulous, just sensationalist lie? What are some of the worst things you think are on television? Oh, I don't get to watch them. <laughs> so I don't, no, I, most people, mostly I get warned by people. Forget about so and so on, on the educational channel or whatever, you know, uh, the learning channel. Yeah, sure, that's learning. Uh, that's not learning, if you ask me. Uh, they, they, have, they have lost all status. I think I just, uh, you know, I, I'm not too in. Yeah, let's put it that way. It's very sad. Uh, so, oh, one second. I haven't had a, a stealth question. First, I have to ask a question of you. How many people here have heard of the million dollar paranormal? That's a good portion. However, not everyone has. Someone just asked me, what's this million dollar thing about? So if you could give your elevator pitch about the million dollar challenge. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came up with the, the idea quite some time ago. Well, first of all, we started out with the thousand dollar challenge when I was doing my radio program on WOR, AM and FM, New York. Gee, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I was, that was 1968 or so. I was uh, doing a radio program out of uh, a radio in New York. They covered 38 states. And uh, on a good night, 40 or more states. Um, and we went from midnight until 5 in the morning. <laughs> and I slept a lot during the day, as you might imagine. Uh, and I offered 
I mean, that was an honor prize. I was on, a, on somebody else's radio program with a standing clip here and some psychic or other, and I use the word quotation marks all this. Uh, Stanley Griffin being a parapsychologist, who is actually a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's totally deluded, but he's okay. Uh, and he knows it. And he doesn't know he's deluded, but he knows he's okay. Uh, and uh, I made a very rash offer, and I said that I would give $1,000 to any psychic who would actually prove that what they were doing was the real thing. But I thought to myself, I've got $1,000. <laughs> uh, I knew I had that much in the bank, barely. But uh, it wasn't always there. I, I drew on it often enough that it was considerably less than a thousand dollars from time to time. That was my first offer, and then it, uh, it, it it came. It, it got a little bit better over the years. And after I'd done my radio program and such, I was appearing on TV programs. I would occasionally mention that there was a thousand dollar challenge, and finally it became a hundred thousand dollars for a program with Lexington. Broadcasting Corporation, and that was a uh, special that was broadcasting across the country. And they were a nervous wreck because I put up ten thousand dollars, they put up ninety thousand dollars, and they were very scared to death that they were going to lose. And Sylvia Brown made her first big TV appearance on that particular program and failed miserably. <laughs> the talent went right down the drain. And uh, she doesn't mention that particular episode. I don't think we were friends. And then um, I. And it was $100,000 for that very brief period and such. And then uh, when we moved into the foundation, uh, our main major sponsor came along, and uh, as he was leaving after inspecting the premises in his camel hair coat, going for his private jet, of course. What a pearl of a jet, what a prince, a real prince, I can assure you. Um, he uh, stopped at the door and said, oh yes, I want you to have this, this will put some teeth offer and he had to be a little check, not, not a big corporation check, but I got that's a little check for one million dollars. And it said all the way in printed, all the way around the border was this check not good for more than one million dollars. This check not good for more than I never had to put that on my check. I never found that necessary in case somebody decided to up the check by some reason. Uh, anyway <clears throat> I yeah, 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 that's what I said to him in, in response something and yeah, yeah, oh, 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 yeah. thank you. And uh, he left in a swirl of camel hair. And uh, I rushed over to the bank and submitted to the teller, and she thought it was a bad joke. Called the manager, and the manager said, All right, deposit it. And when it gets kicked back, we'll be bringing an action against you. And he said, Yeah, sure, no, I won't be in this bank, don't worry. Uh, and I took my account to the bank immediately. But uh, yes, I mean, Got the eight million dollars that way, and it was uh, deposited, and it's been in there ever since. It's currently 1.24 or something billion. Uh, we only will give away the million. Uh, they, we, we dip into it every now and then for projects that we have to do with the James Randi Educational Foundation, or the JRF, as we actually refer to it as. So um, it's there, and it is available to any person or persons who can provide evidence of any paranormal, occult, or supernatural event or occurrence of any kind performed under proper observing conditions. Those conditions to be decided by uh, discussions between the uh, person who's trying to beat the challenge and uh, ourselves. And it's always given to somebody else to do. I don't have anything to do with it. In fact, I insist that I'm not present at the proceedings. Uh, the experiment because the favorite excuse they give when they lose is that I put out negative vibrations. <laughs> and so I, I always ask them to do it at a time when I won't be aware of them doing it. As a matter of fact, the one I did with the BBC and the Royal Society in, uh, in London, they, they made out all of the rules and such. And I said, well, uh, you go ahead and you do the experiment and call me when it's done. He said, oh, no, we'll call you. I will want you. No, no, I, I don't want to be anywhere near it because they'll talk about the vibrations. So, uh, I said, do it sometime. And then 48 hours later, call me and tell me that it's been done because I shouldn't know when it's been done. I said, all right, put out the vibrations. And they called me and I went over to London and uh, sat there in front of the statistician who worked out the results in his computer, I sat there and found out whether or not I had lost a million dollars, or the foundation had lost a million dollars. 
So that's that's the, the form that it takes. Uh, we don't get a great number of people. I, I didn't notice any people lined up outside here for the Dalton County. That rather surprises me. You think there would be somebody, you know? They always promise to show up. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Oh, you betcha. I'll be there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. They just don't show up. And you think that they would be besieging you, standing outside my window and banging at the window or something. I, I don't know why they don't show up. Well, that's, that's a million dollars. You don't really have the million dollars. Or it's actually just a CIA plot where you will abduct them once you learn of their abilities. Or a million dollars is enough. They will that. Yeah, no, they say that I haven't got the million dollars. Now, I, when they started to say that, I immediately made an offer on SWIFT, our, our uh, uh, vehicle whereby we communicate with the rest of the world on the internet, um, <clears throat> named after Jonathan Swift, as you might guess. Um, I immediately made an offer and said that anyone who doubts that the million dollars exists, all they have to do is call me by telephone, teletype, uh, radio, uh, thought waves, Carrot cards, any means they want to get in touch with me, or come around to the door, and anything like that. Yeah. And uh, we will send them documented proof in a, in a, a certified letter, the whole thing all sworn before an attorney, uh, such that the million dollars does exist. Since that offer, about many, many years now, never once has any of the psychics have ever asked for that evidence, but they still go around claiming that the million dollars doesn't exist. I'll explain that if you want. Jeanette? Well, anybody who knows anything about you, and I, I know there's some new people here who are just learning about you, uh, would have to admit that you've led a, have, are still leading a very, very interesting life. Your radio career, your conjuring career, your uh, television stints with Johnny Carson, and now this incredible work with the Jerry Rat. But they would really think you were cool if you had ever been involved in rock and roll. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, would you like to talk, comment on that? I did have a small experience. Yes. I was, uh, <laughs> as a magician, in my early 20s, I, uh, well, oh, I don't know, maybe I don't know, I'd have to really count it. Um, I was in Fossil's Magic Shop on West 34th Street. Manhattan doesn't exist any longer, and uh, Mr. Fossil has gone to whatever rest he may have been pursuing, and uh, no longer wouldn't see him. But I was sitting in the magic uh, shop up on the second floor with some of my colleagues sitting around telling tall tales, and some of the stories were true, I uh, suspect. And um, phone rang, Fossil went over the phone. This is my invitation to Al Fossil. Hello! Yeah, this is Al Fossil. We want to just a little hold on. Oh, the phone here wants magician to do magic tricks for a rock star of some kind. I said, Hold on, I'm, I'm eligible, but I want $100 to talk to him about it. He wants $100 to talk to him. He says, Okay, hey. <laughs> so I maybe sprang up into my chair, got the address, and uh, actually walked down to Greenwich Village. Or Alive Enterprises was uh, was uh, headquartered. Walked into their headquarters, and I was quite impressed by the surroundings. They had potted plants everywhere. They were all dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is in keeping with Alice Cooper, you see, because that was Alice Cooper's office. And uh, I didn't meet Alice at that time, or Cooper, as we called him. But I met Chef Gordon, his manager. Chef got me into the office, and he said, Could you do this? Could you do that? I suggested that we go walking a team where we cut off Alice's head every night. And uh, he said, sounds good, sounds good. Uh, how much money do you want? I told him, said, yeah, that's, that's quite reasonable. I said, I'll give him my day more. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a handsome salary, and it would take me away for 90 days at Turing with Alice Cooper and we had the group. And I had a ball. It was a very professional show. Alice is now becoming a Jesus freak, so we, we, don't, uh, we don't discuss that. But I did go to the 60th birthday party last year in Phoenix, Arizona, where he lives. And uh, hit it off well with everybody there. It was, uh, there were some disastrous stories to tell about my, the tour and such, some sad things as well. But nonetheless, it was a group of really, really professional people at the top of their, their game. 
and uh, we made fortunes. Uh, it was called the Billion Dollar Baby Tour, and uh, there was a book written about it, and it's called the Billion Dollar Baby Tour. A perfect title, I thought. <laughs> and uh, they, there's an episode in there where the gentleman who was going to, well, Bob Green wrote the book, and I won't get into all that. It was a far too much of your time, but if you want to grab the actors, I would. Story. But it was a very interesting tour. I, I toured with Alice Cooper, and we kept in touch ever since. And uh, he's, he's a fine job. And it, is it true that all you had to do during the show was pull a rabbit out of a hat, or did you actually do something a little bit more interesting? I, I did something very. Yeah, I scared the rabbits. Yes, <laughs> he would have eaten them alive. I was taking them. No, I, I chopped off his head with a big guillotine every night. And as I say, it never worked. It was in the back of the next night. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I also played the man dentist. I think a couple of other small parts of the, the repertoire of the company that he had going there. Oh, and it, when we got to Phoenix, by the way, this is I have to share with you. When we got to Phoenix, his hometown, he came to me looking very serious. He said, uh, and he said, Mother, could you, could you take time out in between your appearances on stage and sit with my mom? <laughs> and I said, your mom? She said, yes, she, she doesn't know what I do. <laughs> she knows I go out and I, I'm in a rock show, but she's never seen the show. She's never even seen pictures of it. We sort of kept it from her. Uh, his mom was the, was the wife of Patrick, of Alice's father, uh, Coop's father. And uh, he is a, uh, a minister of all things. And <clears throat> yeah, uh, rather strange uh, perfection for the for the father of Alice Cooper, I would, I would think. And uh, so I, I agreed to go into the ice and sit with her. I met her, and she was a lovely little old lady. Not that I, all the noise going on around her with the kids screeching uh, about Alice Cooper and whatnot. She didn't know what it was all about. I said, now you must be alive. You must be alive. I'll sit with you. And I wasn't in the opening of the show. You see, so bang, 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 and the whole thing. And Alice walked out on stage in the tattered, torn, Costume that he wore, carrying a rag doll by the ear, and with a microphone, screeching into the microphone, school, etc. I almost did the whole song. And um, <laughs> his mother was sitting there saying, Oh, that's his original form name. They gave it away. So, well, why is he dressed like that? He's, his costume is all torn. I said, you know, that's, that's part of the costume. See, he does it that way. And uh, why, is he, why is he bashing me? He's stepping on the door. Why is he stepping on the door? Well, you see, that it's an act that he does. He has to look like he's a, a terrible person. He's not. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> she was horrified. Well, I had to leave her that morning. I had to go and get dressed up as the bad dentist. And so I said, well, I'll be pregnant. We left the guard rooms, and uh, I did the thing. And came back to her. Well, I got back to her. She was looking at her all. They love him, don't they? I said, yes, they sure do. He's making a lot of money with it. She says, so I'm told. <laughs> she had actually settled into it. And she heard about it. So at her 60th birthday party, I saw her sitting over the corner there. I went over to her. And she stood up in a great way. She said, you saved me, you know, you saved me. I haven't seen her since then. So you can believe that. Yeah, uh, Vincent Fernier, now known as Alice Cooper, is a, is a great guy. He's a, as I said, he's a Jesus freak, and that's right thing. But uh, it's understandable to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, I like him a lot. He's, uh, he's very true, very honest, and uh, straightforward. And I like him a lot. He's a good friend of mine. All right, I know we could do this all day, and now the questions come. Isn't this how we do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all right. they're nearby, too. I saw three hands go up. We're going to do those, and then you put up your hand to be the floor. There was another one over here. And then there's another Come on now. All right. I'm going to do the, the, the four hands that are up. I'm going to start who's closest to me and then go down. So as I finish with her, put up your hands again, and you're going to get the last word, Jason. Not Mr. Um, okay. You were talking about Alice Cooper. I wonder if you want to mention uh, what happened when you were in Canada and what uh, during that tour and what made you feel that 
how you didn't want to stay in my country of origin anymore in yours, Canada? Well, very briefly, yes. We played Niagara Falls uh, in Canada, and uh, we were given a locker room as a dressing room because it was a high school that we, that we performed at. We didn't have another venue. And uh, I had to do several costume changes uh, during that, so I took an empty locker and I threw up my, my goods in there. And um, the, uh, the RCMP, which is the equivalent of the FBI and the federal police in Canada, uh, showed up on the scene. I wasn't aware of it at that time. I went out on stage and I did my thing. Uh, I did the mad dentist came back to the dressing room, it was locked. And there was an officer standing at the door. And he asked me what I wanted, and I said, I need my costumes in there, I need to change. And he said, no, nobody goes in there. I said, I've got to get back out on the stage, I'm part of the show, this is what I do. And he said, oh, you want to go in there? I said, yes, I'm going to go. He said, okay, but you're not coming back out again. He opened the door, pushed me inside, slammed the door, Places full of RCMP officers, and they were tearing the joint up. They were literally taking doors off lockers, destroying everything that they found, tearing stuff up and throwing. They were looking for narcotics, so they didn't find anything, and they were a little unhappy about that. So they were literally tearing everything up and stuff the school kids had stored in lockers, too. They were throwing it out on the floor and trying to destroy it as much as they could. They pretty well trashed the whole show that was stored inside that particular set, most of it backstage. But uh, whatever they can find there, they can destroy it, they destroy it. And uh, so I finally fought my way out of there, and I rushed to the stage, and I told them what was happening backstage. And they sent the security people back, and the security people were afraid of the RCMP. Uh, I, uh, we, we did the show. We did the show. Somehow, we got through the show. But it was a terrible experience. I went to the Iron Falls newspaper the very next morning. We had to leave in the afternoon. And uh, I spoke to the uh, one of the reporters there, and he wrote it all down. I called him a couple of days later and he said, No, the editor nixed it because he's scared of the RCMP. He said, They'll take some sort of revenge on us and we'll, we'll have big trouble. No, we won't touch the story. And they never, never published the story. So I decided that uh, the United States of America was a better place to live. And I've been here ever since. Okay. So, Next, in line? No, I didn't have that over here. No, I didn't have that over here. Something you said earlier uh, about uh, Sagan's wife, uh, the, last, the last moment they had together, um, that, that was the last moment they were going to see, that last time they were going to see each other, and that was okay. Maybe you want to ask this question. Um, what was your last interaction with uh, Carl Sagan, and uh, were you happy with it? Oh, my last interaction, well, yeah. Uh, I didn't have a, a last reaction with him after he got sick. I, I was in touch with him uh, when he was sick, and he was he had to get a, a bone marrow transplant from his brother, I think, or a brother, or I'm sorry, I, I, I do forget what relative, but it was a close relative in Canada, and it, it currently worked. But I looked up the research on it, and it turns out that bone marrow transplants like that often appear to work very dramatically very dramatically and almost instantly, and the patient is very exhilarated and such, and then it suddenly goes into a downward curve, and they're very, very quickly out of the picture. And that's what happened with Carl, unfortunately. He, uh, he sent me a photograph. of him, and uh, it's a simple black and white photograph, a big smile. And when I, I got it, I was, uh, I opened it up and I put it through the shredder because it showed him with his face all sunken in, but smiling. It was the last picture he had taken and I uh, didn't want to remember it that way. And in my office now I have a picture of him with myself. And we're smiling in much better times. And that was, uh, that was the last uh, connection that I had with Carl, and uh, it, was, it was so unfortunate that I, I shredded the picture because I, I, I just couldn't look at it. I couldn't look at it, and I didn't want to keep it. It was not the memory I wanted to have on 
Natural. Yes, um, have you seen the Carl Sagan tribute series on YouTube? And if so, what do you think of it? No, I, I must admit I have not seen that um, on YouTube. Uh, I, I have to have to remedy that in the situation. But I'm very sad when I see Carl now. Um, I had a very hard time with the set of discs, uh, the, the revamped show, the improved. And I think that is an improvement of the original columns. They really augmented it considerably. I have a hard time looking at it and reading it. I, but I think if I sat down with the right people, with close friends and such, and, and you try to see it on a big screen, uh, that I could, I could see it through. And I, I really have to force myself to do this, to get over this, but uh, it's tough. He watched, he watched his old man say he was so sick of tired standing in a cardboard spaceship. <laughs> 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 and it's true, it was cardboard. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I can laugh, I can laugh, and I can remember those good moments, but looking at that series, uh, wow, it's tough. Andrew, this man, by the way, is Andrew Jason, who, uh, uh, have you already told the folks? No? No. Well, Andrew, uh, he's his uh, brother, uh, Alec Jason, who was the private detective who unmasked Peter Popoff by making recordings of his wife talking to him backstage. Hello, Petey, can you hear me? If you can't, you're in big trouble, <laughs> etc. cetera. Uh, yes, and, uh, so he's a good friend of mine, a frequent habitue at, of the uh, foundation when it existed as it used to, and I'm very happy to see him. Thank you. Better answer a good question, Bill. Very yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I hope you can tell us about um, Carl Sagan's views on his agnosticism. Uh, views on agnosticism? Well, yeah. Uh, this business of agnosticism, I, I'm, I'm a little uncertain of the whole thing. I've read the definitions, uh, I've read the dictionary uh, accounts of what agnostic is supposed to be. I think it's pretty damn wishy-washy, um, and I refuse to accept the label. I, I accept the label of uh, atheist second definition that's in Webster's. The first definition says, one who denies the existence uh, of a deity. The second one is one who uh, does not find sufficient evidence to believe in a deity. And I'm of the second kind. I can't prove there is no deity. I can't prove there are no unicorns in South Africa, for example, either. <laughs> so I can't prove that kind of a negative. Some negatives I can prove. I'm not a giraffe. By definition alone, I'm not quite as tall. My neck isn't as long, and I'm much cuter. So <laughs> I'm not a giraffe. So some negatives I can prove. But um, Carl's, uh, Carl stuck with uh, agnostic as, as he wanted to uh, define it, and uh, I don't accept that label. That was, that was a difference that I didn't have with him as well, so we had some differences, it's true. <laughs> 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 Lousy camera. Lousy camera. <laughs> Why are you on credit? Did that work? Otherwise, you're thumb up. I'm running out of here. Well enough. Here you Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, appreciate it. Mr. James Randy. We also have a beautiful astronomy calendar. Um, the bad news is it's a Mayan calendar, so it only goes to December 21st. <laughs> uh, 
We have an event t shirt. Oh, like yes. the one I'm wearing. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we also have a Florida orange. I know you live here. <laughs> and we have two uh, Milky Way candy bars. Oh, so, boy. <laughs> so, uh, she knows uh, me. <laughs> okay, so again, we, we're just delighted you're here. Thank you. And we know that you will be all at all of them. All as long as you'll keep asking about. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps up the third annual Carl Sagan Day. Thank you very, very much for coming. And as the first thing I said, this is the third of many. And bring friends next year. Thank you very much. If you haven't lost them by questioning their religious tendencies. And this is your last chance to make a cash donation on your way down. We would appreciate it. Thank you. I just left 12 library books under the chair. Okay. Were you recording? Everything. Oh, thank God, because our, our video. It was the until I hate when that happens. It's happened to me before. Um.